Hello and welcome to Monash Matters. Today we've got with us uh, Kasia Warland and Chris Nemeth, both who have been vaccinated. You can tell by their T-shirts, obviously. Uh, Kasia, you might like to let me know, um, as I'm having a look at your T-shirt, uh, what was the genesis of those T-shirts? Um, oh, well, I, I have done a couple of interviews before and um, I did one with, with Hoodie and I, I often... Like after I've done an interview, I get lots of people contact me and and thank me, and then that just makes me realise that we're you know we're all in this together, and you know we're trying to we're all fighting the same cause, and I just wanted to do something to like you know to speak up a bit more, so I decided to get a T-shirt made up so that when I go out, um, people people know what's wrong with me so I made this t-shirt and then I covered my wheelchair in lots of signage that says it's okay to ask and I believe you should know the truth and and the vax injured as well and every time I go out which isn't very often but every time I go out I always get someone come and talk to me about it and they all have their own stories yesterday I popped to um for out for a coffee with a friend and the lady that approached me started explaining that she'd lost three family members and, and friends because of the COVID vax. And it, so it, it, it's, a, it's a chance for people to come and talk to me and open up about it. It reminds me that we need to keep speaking up and it's not fair um, and people really appreciate it. So it was going really well. So I um, made contact with Coverse and suggested that we found a uh, a manufacturing company that would be able to just to supply them as as people um, wanted them, and so now they're available on the Covers website for everyone. So there's Vax injured, and there's supporters ones, and there's different years. So, um, but it, it does make a big difference when I'm out. People yeah. don't need it. <laughs> So, um, Kashi, you've always been in a wheelchair. No, not at all. I um, I was a teacher and a gymnast and a gymnastics coach. I started doing gymnastics from the age probably of six or seven. I've always been involved with it. Um, I I would still be training as an adult, and I did some adult competitions back in England before I emigrated over here. So I've always been really active. Um, really healthy out and about but since my vaccine injury which was just over two and a half years ago now um, I'm not able to walk very far when I'm at home I can kind of move around I'll hold on to a wall or furniture to get about but um, when I go out I can't because I can't walk very far I need to be in a wheelchair for that. Prior to the vaccinations um, just how fit were you? Could you do a backflip as a gymnast? Oh, yeah, I yeah I was um, I was still doing backflips and somersaults. I I actually did a, a a music video with my class six months before my injury, and so there's a video of me in there doing backflips on the um, on the oval. Well, I'm I'm going to get one of my staff members Tanya to uh, get hold of that video <laughs> prior to this program. Chris, I'm not going to ask you to um, whether you can do back, back <laughs> or somersaults from a standing yeah. start. Um, so, um, Kasia, before we leave you, and we're not leaving you all together, but would yeah. you tell us um, what did the doctors say about your injuries or your first hospitalisation? What did they put it down to? Oh, at the beginning, they put it down to anxiety um, and there's a funny story, but actually it, it worked out really well. So my friend was actually going to his first Olympics when I got sick. And the day I ended up in hospital, he was racing and he actually got a gold medal. And I also have a video of me jumping up and down. Very happy, obviously. Um, no anxiety at all. I'd had a really good day. So it actually really helped that I had this story that, that could be checked. So it, it definitely wasn't anxiety, but it's it's so hard getting doctors to 
or at the beginning it was very hard to get doctors to be honest about the about the injury I think I was in hospital in and out about four times at the beginning I must have seen oh 10 maybe a maybe a dozen different specialists and there was only one that bothered to come in the room and sit down and talk to me and really listen um to what was going on the rest just wanted to give me some panadol and send me away yeah well let's let's um give you a let, let's somersault then to <laughs> chris um what happened to you so a little bit like car uh, show i was you know, fit active involved in my community i was a football coach locally uh, you know, had a career of 30 years in international freight and logistics and then uh, had my first dose in July of 2021 and things went downhill from there pretty quickly. Was that mandated your work Chris? Uh, it wasn't at that time but the mandates were coming you could see them yeah so uh, had my vaccine uh, we we're told constantly it's safe and effective uh, especially down here in Melbourne where I am if we wanted to get out of the really heavy restrictions that we were under, things like the ring of steel, we were told, get the vaccination, this is the way forward. So went and did that. Uh, ended up initially, my first hospitalisation was in August of 2021. So less than a month after having the, the vaccine, the left side of my face dropped. So initially the doctors thought it was Bell's palsy, but things escalated pretty quickly from there. I got to a point where I, I was struggling to walk unaided and the diagnosis was revised to uh, Guillain-Barre syndrome. Uh, things continued to, to get worse. Uh, by November, I was paralysed from the waist down, had limited use of my hands, so I was back in hospital. Uh, spent 10 days in hospital, then transferred to a rehab hospital for four weeks to learn to walk again. And was discharged just before Christmas in 2021. In January of 2022, the diagnosis was again revised to chronic inflammatory demyelinating polyneuropathy, or CIDP for short. And in really basic terms, my immune system now targets the lining around my nerve fibres. So the signals don't travel to and from my brain and my extremities in the way that they should. So I suffer now daily, constantly with pins and needles, tingling and burning, both hands and both feet. I manage that with medication every day. Also uh, have balance issues. I have tremors in my hands. Uh, fatigue is there all the time. And that brain fog and lack of ability to concentrate for a long time that a lot of people talk about, I suffer with that as well. I've not been able to return to work since September of 2021. Uh, every three weeks now, I spend five hours in hospital receiving an IV treatment. It's a plasma product. It basically keeps me stable. Uh, so th that's where I am. Uh, the long-term view, this condition has no cure. And at some stage in the future, it's likely I'll face another you know, level of paralysis at some point and probably multiple episodes of it across the rest of my life. Well, I hope that's not the case. Um, so do I. <laughs> I'm, hoping, I'm hoping and hoping and hoping for complete recovery uh, for people, both for both of you and the many others that I've spoken to. I'm not getting good reports on that, but that's what I believe um, we can get to. Even if it, I, I don't know what's going to do that, but there must be some uh, way of reversing the damage that's been done. Um, so where are we at now? What do you think, um, have you, I asked uh, Kasia, Kasia about the doctors um, and what the, what their process was. Have you, um, have they, any of them acknowledged that your vet's injured? For me, yeah, I've been really fortunate that my doctors, my GP right from the start, supported me in that this was a vaccine injury and then my neurologist as well so simply the timing and the nature of the in injury uh, we found out after i'd had my vaccine that the, the one that i took in particular did have strong links to causing guillain barre syndrome 
and CIDP is the chronic version of that. So my doctors have been very supportive. So yeah, I'm thankful for that. And I know that that's not been the case for a lot of my fellow vaccine injured. What about you, Kasia? Yeah, I my neurologist um, has has expressed that his in his opinion my diagnosis is definitely from the vax injury um i've also had a lot of problems with my menstrual cycle my ovaries especially and i've started seeing a private gynecologist and she too instantly um expressed her opinion that women's menstrual cycles will never be the same again having had the vaccine um, but none of them are able to like they just don't know what to do with us like I've I've been given medication to try and the doctors have said like like B, B12 shots at the beginning my B12 was really low and um, the doctors would always say oh you'll feel really good after this you know whenever whenever anyone has B12 they feel more alert more awake but when I had it um, I was bedridden for about two weeks after every vaccination um, and it definitely did not make me feel better. So I found that with quite a few medications, they'll, they'll put you, they'll trial you on a medication to try and alleviate some of the, the problems and they just don't work or they said they go in the opposite direction. I ended up in hospital the other week after being put on some medication that was like nobody had ever had a problem with and they don't understand why my body is reacting in that way. So the doctors, like they, the ones that are, are really open and helpful, they are really trying, but they just don't know what to do. It's It's so unknown to them. You know, they keep trying, but they just they genuinely just don't know how to treat us. So that's a really big problem. Right. Um, so where are we at today? Uh, well, I'm fortunate that I managed to complete the total permanent disability process. So I had income protection for two years. And then when it was getting towards the end, I was able to apply for that. It was an absolutely uh, horrendous, stressful journey. Um, but we had no choice with that. Without that, like we would have lost our home. We would have lost everything. Um, so I managed to get that, which will probably is it just gives us a bit of breathing space for a few years. That That's basically all it is. Um, the doctors have said they don't think I will ever get back to my old normal. I might get a little bit better, but I'm never going to be able to to be a teacher again. I'm not going to be able to work in that capacity. Um, so so I'm not getting a wage anymore and I'm trying to sort out um, organising my retirement through the Queensland education. And that has just been a nightmare nobody's helpful i don't i feel like maybe i've just lost trust in the government unfortunately and um in in things like that but they don't like i haven't had any support from queensland education at all nobody's tried to help me i just feel like they they put um walls up you know to make it harder so in order to to get my um, retirement so that I can apply for a pension. Um, I've been told there are two two routes. I can either sign a voluntary form and then that's all done, or there is another huge process, rather like the, the one for um, total permanent disability. And, and, and nobody will explain to me the difference of the outcome. And I can't believe that one is a I sign a form voluntary and it's all done. And the other one is this massive, um, you know, this massive journey. Yet they're both the same. I just I don't feel it's been explained to me properly. Um, I tried to. I, I tried to. Um, sorry, my brain's gone. <laughs> my brain's gone. <laughs> Kasia, uh, just before I go to Chris, um, what compensation have you received? Um, well, I've just had my total permanent disability and with that I chose to take my pension to just 
because there is there is nothing else. I did try and apply for the COVID compensation scheme, but I was rejected before I I even left go. I didn't get to go around the board and collect my two hundred dollars. Why? My symptoms don't fit on the on the list for the vaccine that I had, so therefore I'm told no straight away. But they did very, they did very kindly um, say that because because my depression is obviously really bad living in this life. Um, they did say that if I had issues with depression or like suicidal thoughts, I could still ring them. <laughs> oh, that's nice. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but you will be applying for compensation again, I take it, for, for your injury? Oh, well, maybe if an opportunity arises. Um, at the moment, I, I've, I've just hit so many brick walls. I've tried NDIS and I've been rejected from that too. Um, so there's, there's nothing that I've been able to find anyway. Yeah, I think the Australian public would be outraged if they knew that. What about you, Chris? So for me, Russell, I, I consider myself relatively lucky. I fit the narrow criteria of the vaccine claim scheme. It's funny, though, when Greg Hunt announced the scheme when he was the, the Federal Minister for Health and Aged Care back in August of 2021, he said that what we needed was a simple to access safety net with a quick administrative process. And that's that's not been my experience. And when I speak out, I worry that it'll have some potentially adverse effect on, on the claim that I've got. It's it's still under process. Um, I, again, I'm really fortunate. I tick all the boxes. Um, I had one of the vaccines that the TGA had authorised. I've got a medically diagnosed vaccine injury that fits the criteria of the scheme in relation to the vaccine that I took. Um, I've had losses exceeding $1,000, which is another one of the criteria. And I was admitted to hospital, which is another one of the criteria. Uh, 34 nights across three different admissions so far. So I, I, again, I'm really lucky and I tick all the boxes under the scheme. Um, the scheme is a, a three-phase uh, three process, I guess. The first is a uh, review. And in order to make my submission, the, the simple to access claim scheme that we were promised, uh, I had to engage a lawyer because it's a 65 page policy document that you need to follow in order to make an application. Uh, that just to prepare the application, working with the lawyer, it took 11 months. And the submission or the application that we put in was over a thousand pages of documents. So three months after that was submitted, that was submitted in March of 2023, so last year, uh, I was having trouble getting any response or update. So that's when I first went to my federal MP. Uh, his office sent a letter to Bill Shorten's office. And subsequent to that letter, I got a, a phone call from Services Australia to say that I'd passed the first review stage. The second stage is an uh, independent medical review of your circumstances, and that's done by the TGA, the same people that cleared these vaccines as being safe and effective for, for use in Australia. Uh, I cleared that stage also after about three months and was told that the reason that I was able to uh, transit that stage so quickly was because of the thoroughness of the presentation. So again, I've worked with a lawyer to get that done. Anyone trying to do it on their own probably wouldn't have the same experience that I had of getting through so quickly. Uh, that the final stage is an independent legal review by a legal panel. Once Services Australia hand those documents or hand that case over to the legal panel, the legal panel have 14 working days to finalise it. I thought once I cleared the second phase, it would be a matter of them handing it over to the legal panel, but that wasn't the case. Uh, I was sent another five page letter with more questions, more information that they required. That was in November of last year. In early December, we answered all of those questions. And then just last week, I had more correspondence from Services Australia with more questions for more information before they can hand it over to the legal panel. 
So my best hope for an outcome now will be March <coughs> this year. But again, I've not worked since September 2021. And in that whole time, I've had no financial support from the government at all, not, not a single seat. No, it's tragic. It's tragic. Um, all right. Sorry, Russell, but my, my case fits the scheme perfectly. So if the experience that I've had, you know, 11 months to put a claim together, 12 months to get an answer, if that's the best case, I feel for those people who maybe are a little bit, you know, less fortunate than myself in terms of their circumstances. And there are certainly a lot of people who sit outside the scheme because it is so narrow, like Cassia. And it just amazes me, Kasia, what this government think you're going to do? I know, I know. I just I just don't understand why there is no help. And they just nobody wants to take responsibility for it. And that's that's the hardest thing. My biggest concern, and probably why I, I, I wear my T-shirts out a lot, is that there's still people walking around that have no idea. Yeah. That, that I think is, like all of it is unfair. You know, we should never have been mandated. It should have been our choice. There should have been a team to go to if there were problems. There was none of that. Um, they should have allowed the doctors to speak and to and to write you know information like right, to to inform each other to help us but but really my biggest concern is is just that that people are walking around and they have no idea and they could be suffering side effects and they don't have the opportunity to go and get get it checked out before it you know it it gets worse well what's the future for both of you please Oh, mine is just... Can I just uh, say you're both in remarkably good spirits and been, <laughs> considering what you've been through? Uh, do you know what? I, I've had a lot of um, a lot of psychology sessions learning to accept this way of life. Like, I've, you know, it's been over two and a half years and I'm not going to get better very quickly if if much at all. So I really have learned to to just accept this is the way it is. Um, and I need to just find things to 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 just keep going really because it's so hard. Like I I I, I say it to my friends all the time. I don't I don't really have a life. I just exist. I'm just here. I can't, you know, I don't get to do all the things that everyone else gets to do. I'm not independent. I'm fully reliant on other people. I can't just get in my car and drive to the shop if I'm out of milk. You know, I have to, and if I go out, I have to plan, you know, plan around it. So I have to make sure I've rested. And then I also have to be prepared to sort of pay for it the next day. Like I will, it will take me two, three days to recover from a little trip out. So it's just really is acceptance and hope that one day there will be, there will be, you know, some help. But, but at the moment I'm just spurred on by, I, I feel like I'm here to try and help the fight because I'm okay um, although I'm having a really bad job of it today because my head, my head's spinning and my brain fog is bad. Like I'm, I'm not worried about speaking out. Like Chris was saying, you know, he he's doing this interview, but he's worrying that it might have a negative effect on his compensation. Whereas I, I feel like I haven't got anything left to lose. But lots of people do feel concerned about speaking out whereas I've I've lost my quality of life I've lost my career I I genuinely I don't feel like I have much else to lose so if there is something that I can do to speak out or to help somebody then that's what drives me forward and that's what keeps me going thanks Kasia <laughs> what about you Chris in summing up in terms of the way forward, it's much like the last two years, probably, Russell, waiting to see the outcome of the claim. That really dictates my entire future, uh, financial stability for myself and my family going forward. Uh, without a, a positive outcome there, I don't know what I'll do. 
uh, probably be in a similar situation to a lot of my fellow vaccine injured who don't fit the scheme and perhaps have to rely on the, the class action that uh, Dr. Melissa McCann is uh, undertaking and leading. Uh, again, a class action is probably going to be a long drawn out affair for people uh, and no help in, in the short term. And like Kasi was saying, the, the reason we speak out is, is to raise awareness. Uh, a lot of what we hear in the media and from the government is that the vaccine injuries are very rare and that when they do occur, they're very mild. And, and that's not the case. And Kasia and I are, are really good examples there. And, and I know there's people even worse off than myself, people who've lost loved ones through these, these vaccines. Uh, so what we're really looking for is awareness for people and, and understanding that the picture that's being painted is probably not accurate. Uh, when the government launched the claim scheme, they set up a portal for people to lodge a, um, like a, a, an intent that they were interested in the scheme once the details came out. They had 10,000 people say, yes, I believe I was moderately or severely injured by the vaccines. Then the criteria and the 65 page policy document for the claims came out and a lot of people realised that they didn't fit that criteria. So at the moment, there's about three and a half thousand people that have lodged claims and Coverse, the, the people who uh, whose T-shirts we're wearing today, who are a really good supporter and, and advocate for vaccine injured people, they estimate that the true number of vaccine injured in Australia is somewhere between that initial 10,000 and 100,000 people. So really, we need people to be aware and to to push and to drive government to, to act now. Uh, I, I don't want to see our situation be like the people who suffered the, solid, the thalidomide injuries. They waited 60 years for an apology and the government surely can look at that and realise that they've got the same situation happening now with the vaccine injured people. Well, they've been pretty silent so far, but thank heaven for people like yourselves who are not silent and will speak out. And um, I'd like to speak to you again, so in a few weeks time, to, just to see how things are going. Yeah, certainly. Any opportunity to speak out, uh, I'll gladly take. Uh, I know there's a lot of our fellow vaccine injured that can't or, or, or feel that they can't speak out. And there's some wonderful voices amongst those people. Well, I'd love them to contact me at any time. So <laughs> any time that they would like to contact me, I'll speak to me and come on the program. I'd love to have them, so you can let them know. So thanks to both of you, to Cassia and to Chris, and uh, I look forward to seeing you in the near future. Thank, 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 you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you to you too, Russell. I know that uh, there's only a couple of voices such as yourselves in terms of, of our parliamentarians, and I know that you've suffered directly from, from that being that voice for the vaccine injured people in particular ways. So. Thank you for, for your bravery as well. I'm not stopping here. <laughs> All the best. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for everybody for being on the program today. Look forward to the next program. Thank you, Russell. Thank you.